Hi, I'm Sunshine Hilligus, Professor of Political Science and Public Policy at Duke University. I want to welcome you to another in the virtual lecture series for the Julian J. Rothbaum Distinguished Lecture in Representative Government. Over the course of several lectures, I've been talking about the problem of youth turnout. Today, what I want to do is switch from talking about why young people don't vote to talking about policy solutions. So in the previous lectures, I introduced the problem and puzzle of youth turnout and offered a new perspective about the reason young people don't vote. I showed that, in contrast to the conventional wisdom, that young people have all the attitudinal precursors to voting. They are interested, they care about who's going to win, and they say they're going to vote when asked before the election, but too many fail to follow through on their turnout intentions. I show that the individuals most likely to follow through have what are called non-cognitive skills. These are competencies related to grit and perseverance that help them to overcome the barriers and distractions that might get in the way of actually following through on their behavioral intentions, whether those behavioral intentions are for exercise or, or for voting in this case. In uh, lectures two and three, I'm going to focus on the policy implications of our finding. So once we recognize the problem is not a lack of interest, but simply an issue of follow through, then we can think about policy solutions from a new angle. We argue there are two key pathways. First, civic education reforms that help to increase the capacity of young people to follow through. And second, electoral reforms that will make voting easier so it's not as hard to follow through. I want to make clear that just because I've shown that young people who have more grit are more likely to, to turn out to vote is not meant to imply that young people just need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Rather, the reason that non-cognitive skills matter is because registration and voting is so difficult in the U.S. Today I want to talk about civic education reform and the way that the education system can better produce um, young voters. So our focus on the potential of schools to improve youth turnout is not just because a lot of the debates and discussions surrounding non-cognitive skills have happened within the education policy realm, although that, that is certainly the case. I think the bigger issue is that civic participation is the very reason the public education was founded in this country. So the founders were very clear that this, they thought the survival of the young democracy would depend on the education and the participation of the public. Thomas, Thomas Jefferson said in 1789, wherever the people are well informed, they can be trusted with their own government. On paper, um, this mission hasn't changed any. A recent Department of Education report, for instance, said, the goal of education and civics and government is informed responsible participation in political life by competent citizens committed to the fundamental values and principles of American constitutional democracy. Okay, so the question is, um, you know, is, are the schools living up to this vision, right? The vision is that civic education will teach young people how to be active citizens. The reality is, is that civics hasn't been a priority in the education system for many decades. So whether we blame, you know, the school accountability movement, the no child left behind type of legislation, the, that refocused attention on testing and accountability and STEM, um, whatever the explanation, civics has fallen by the wayside. Some have argued that we just need to reprioritize civics. This is the message of Sandra Day O'Connor and Obama and others who have said that um, it's very clear that, that civics is not getting its due in the schools, and so we just need to reinvest in, and give more attention to civics. I first want to, to, to challenge the notion, right, that it's just about the amount of civics. So first um, step, I think, is to consider um, whether or not just the current curriculum, but more of it, would help to increase youth turnout. Let's first review some stylized facts about the current curriculum. So as we've talked about, there's been a decline in the emphasis of civics within the schools. 70% of teachers acknowledge as much. But it's also the content. Um, it, the content is focused on things that are testable. Memorization about facts and figures from history. My co-author and I call this bubble sheet civics. And this is also related to how it's being taught. So the pedagogical approach is one of teachers lecturing to the, the students about these different facts and figures. It's not interactive and it's definitely not connected to today's um, politics. 
and frankly, it's it's not actually just the educators that are at fault. So this model of civics that we see in the schools actually fits with the existing political science theories about what matters for voting. So when we look at the classic literature, the determinants of voting are, are often things like education, cognitive skills, verbal skills. There's this idea out there that to be involved in the complex political environment, it helps to have raw cognitive skills, that those who can read and write and persuade can process political information and know what they need to know in order to be engaged. So these classic research studies um, are really focused on political knowledge, and cognitive abilities as the key determinants of voting. So what um, I would challenge back to that classic literature is to say, you know, there must be more to the story because we've seen over time just an incredible increase in years of educational attainment. So uh, more kids are going to college than, than ever before. And yet the turnout rate among young people has been quite flat. So something else is going on. Um, the first step in, in figuring that out is, you know, to figure out how to change and, and reform uh, civics education. We first look to see, is the current civics curriculum um, working? So the blunt answer is no. In the book, we go through ex exhaustive empirical um, evidence, looking at every survey we can find that has measures of voting as well as uh, civics courses. Even when we find a small positive relationship, it tends to be small and, and tends to disappear when we um, apply more rigorous analysis. Um, I, I just want to show you one example here. Okay, so, so here's what we've done um, in this particular analysis. We look to see, does a state adding a, require, a civics requirement or taking it away, does it have an impact on youth turnout in the state? No matter how we cut the data, um, it turns out the answer is no. So the current curriculum then, it, it's not working. Civics education is not providing students with what they need to know in order to vote. They're not living up to this basic core mission of the public education system. Now, to be fair, um, there is evidence that, that um, civics does increase political knowledge. But as we've talked about over the course of these lectures, political knowledge isn't enough um, to make young voters. So when we saw these empirical results, frankly, they weren't that much of a surprise because um, we started this project by talking to civics teachers. We wanted to find out, did they still see it as part of their mission to make young voters, to make their students um, civically engaged? The answer is yes, absolutely. But then we ask them, you know, can you think of anything that prevents you from making your students more engaged in politics? And their responses were quite telling. So for instance, one teacher said, time, always time, and the standardized testing. Another teacher said, I really like doing mock elections in my class, but I don't always have the time because I'm held to making sure my students pass the standardized test. Another theme that emerged in conversations with a number of teachers was also this fear of touching on things that are too polarized. So one teacher said, it's really hard when you have parents who don't want their child to hear different sides. And so it, it, it definitely uh, came up that teachers were trying to avoid current political debates because of concerns um, about how to navigate that with parents. Okay, so what can schools do? Evidence-based reforms cover three specific changes. For each of these, I'll walk through some of the empirical findings that motivate our recommendation. So number one, we think schools need to focus on the development of non-cognitive skills. Problem solving, motivational skills are important or more important than memorizing historical facts. Second, we need discussion connected to actual current politics, not just history, the now. Finally, we need schools to view it as a responsibility to register young people to vote. Okay, so in the previous lecture, we talked about um, the evidence that connects non-cognitive voting um, to uh, non-cognitive skills to, to voting um, and, and talked about the fast track ex experiment. So the key point here is just that um, within the civics curriculum, you know, we need to think about how to develop those non-cognitive skills. So rather than memorizing, you know, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, 
maybe we need to think about, you know, what do kids do if they show up at the polling location and their name isn't on the voter file? What are the voter I forms of voter ID that they can use um, in, um, in, in registering and, and voting? So, you know, we need to, to think about the various hurdles that young people will encounter in the registration and voting process and make sure that the schools are teaching that information. Okay, active civic learning. Second, civics should not be disconnected from the current political environment. When students are engaged in current politi political debates and activities, they're more likely to vote. So there was a randomized control trial um, in which um, underprivileged kids were randomized to the democracy prep charter program and it, the, the uh, analysis found that those who um, participated in the curriculum, which was focused on community involvement and political discussion, were more likely to vote than the kids who wanted to go but didn't uh, randomly get assigned. So um, it works to engage kids um, in active civic learning. Finally, schools need to register young people to vote. Yeah, and this is not just put a table in the cafeteria. What is needed is in-class voting de demonstrations and assistance in the classroom. One experimental study that I'm reporting on here found that just 40 minutes of class time to go through the process of registration and voting, uh, practicing the mechanics of the process, increased youth turnout by more than five percentage points. This in-class in, in assistance is important because research has found that young people often make mistakes, omitting their signature or signing with a nickname rather than their full name, and this can result in their application being rejected. In earlier research, I found that it was the combination of pre-registration laws and in-class demonstrations that was especially effective at increasing youth turnout. Pre-registration in particular empowers schools to be able to reach the youngest kids and bring them into the process while they're in high school. Okay, the, the final thing that I want to uh, touch on wasn't actually talked about in the book and, um, and I didn't list it as one of the three, but is a, a theme that emerged in both conversations with young people and some uh, initial empirical um, results. And that is, schools need to help address the fact that young people are misinformed about what they need to know in order to vote and be a good voter. So it turns out that, that what I've noticed is that young people have very high standards for what they think they need to know in order to be a good voter. It, in these qualitative interviews, some young people said that the reason they stayed home is they didn't feel well informed, um, even though they wanted to vote and they had just intended to do more research and, and, and hadn't gotten around to it. Uh, you know, schools need to teach individuals that the, the, the things that you need to know, you need to know how to register. You need to know if you need an ID. You don't need to know the details of every candidate platform or even the name of every candidate running on every down the ballot race, you know, the dog catcher and the city council. Young people hold themselves to a higher standard than older voters. And don't get me wrong, more knowledge is, is, is better. But on the other hand, experienced voters know that we are able to muddle through and figure out which candidate is going to represent our interests simply by leaning on you know, the heuristic of party. In a two-party system, you don't have to know everything about every individual candidate. You can look at the D or R and figure out um, which uh, candidate is probably going to be better if you haven't done more research. So this uh, jumped out in some polling data that I, I looked at where um, the, the question asked, do you feel that all eligible American citizens should vote or should, should people only vote if they're well informed about the elections? Only 40% of young people said that all Americans should vote compared to 64% of those 65 and plus. So it, it just turns out that young and old people have different views of what you need to know in order to be a good voter. So uh, I blame this partly on civics education, that you know we are focusing on um, this memorization of facts and figures that, that really emphasizes political knowledge. Also, perhaps a reflection of the information environment where, you know, you could spend every minute of every day researching the candidates and the parties and the, um, the policies and still not learn at all. Um, and so I think that, that young people have, um, you know, misaligned expectations um, about what they need to do um, and know in order to be a good citizen. Okay, so let me summarize. Um, 
it, it turns out that memorizing facts about government history, um, this bubble sheet civics, it, it might minimally increase political knowledge, but it's not teaching young people what they actually need to know to vote. It's n and it's not just the amount of civics has declined, though that is the case. It's just we're not teaching the right information. We need to talk about current politics, and teachers need better training on how to navigate this, giving the sensitivity of that um, with parents. We need to teach the mechanics of registration and voting, things like what's the deadline for registering before the election, what voter ID is needed, and how do you get it if you don't have one. Young people are far less likely these days to have driver's license than they used to. So just 25% of 16-year-olds have a driver's license now, less than half of 17-year-olds. So um, in the next lecture, I'm going to talk about the importance of these election laws, but I would just note that the rules are not necessarily being taught in civics courses. A 2020 poll found that half of voters under the age of 35 felt they didn't have enough information to vote by, by mail. We need schools to focus on those mechanics. We need schools to actually give instruction and assistance in completing registration forms. The evidence shows it works, and it's the best time and environment to re remove one of the key obstacles to participation for young people. Okay, so in the next lecture, I'll talk more about the role of registration and voting laws and outline the most effective electoral reforms to improve youth turnout. I hope you'll join me. Thank you for your time and attention.